Very good. We want to be right on time. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Roxana Moran, uh, and I'm here with Dr. Fuster. Really, really one of the best things about being at our institution and working with Dr. Fuster uh, is our ability to bring giants to give us uh, lectures uh, from time to time. Quite often, especially nowadays, um, through the incredible um, um, connections, our global connections uh, that Dr. Fuster established over the last 40 years here. Um, today is, uh, is very special for me uh, because our speaker uh, is uh, one, of my, one of my many mentors who's been um, working, we've been working and I've learned from him so much. Um, Today we have Dr. Bernie Gersh, professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, consultant in cardiovascular diseases and internal medicine. He was previously the W. Proctor Harvey teaching professor of cardiology, chief of the division of cardiology at Georgetown University. That's when I met him first, when I was trying to go there for fellowship, but I ended up with Dr. Fuster. He um, is, an incredible, it started when he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And uh, of course, he uh, began his studies in Cape Town in South Africa. But uh, over the years, his interests have gone from on so many different levels, probably one of the world's expert in atrial fibrillation, coronary acute and chronic coronary syndromes, uh, sudden cardiac death. His ability to dissect um, and bring to clinicians what clinical trials have shown. And his teaching is incredible. And he's served on so many data safety monitoring boards that I have had the pleasure of working with. Greg Stone and I have uh, worked with him extremely closely over the years. And uh, he just recently led the data safety monitoring as the chair of the data safety monitoring board of the twilight study, which was a difficult one with aspirin withdrawal in complex patients. We are so thrilled uh, to have Dr. Gersh with us. Thank you, uh, Bernie, for being here this morning to talk to us about the indications for and preferred methods of coronary revascularization in chronic coronary syndromes, reconciling some of these very difficult trials that have had a lot of attention, both in the media in the in the public forum, et cetera. Dr. Gersh, welcome to Mount Sinai. Thank you very much, uh, Roxana. I've always enjoyed speaking at Mount Sinai. It's great to see you. And uh, as an aside, um, Dr. Fuster played a role in my being recruited uh, to Mayo. So we've known each other and been friends for a long time. So uh, I used the term chronic coronary syndrome. Uh, for a specific reason. This is an editorial suggesting it's time that we, for us to consolidate the nomenclature of stable ischemic heart disease. The terminology is varied. Uh, ACC AHA guidelines 2002, chronic stable angina. 2012, it's called stable ischemic heart disease. Uh, ESC guidelines 2013, stable coronary disease. And I was involved with the recent ESC guidelines of 2019. And after much discussion, I think we came up with a correct term, and that is chronic coronary syndromes. Because after all, chronic stable angina, is, it is stable until it becomes unstable. And if you look at a um, series of patients with chronic stable angina treated medically, uh, event rates are very high. So I prefer to use the term chronic coronary syndromes, which we did in the guidelines. Now to start off with the trials that compared uh, coronary revascularization with medical therapy in patients with, here I am going to use the term mild to moderate chronic stable angina, because that was used at the time of the trials. And these are the trials that basically showed no difference in death or MI. The first with the trials of bypass surgery and medical therapy, you have to realize these trials are almost 30 years old. They still drive our guidelines. And I think some of the conclusions are still valid, but these are old trials and medical therapy in 1980, there was no medical therapy. 
is basically not having an operation. But what they did show, free trials in Europe and in the States, that there was a benefit in terms of death and MI in sicker patients with severe angina, multivessel disease, and left um, and LV dysfunction. I'll come on to uh, left main disease at the later stage. Trials of PTCN and medical therapy, no benefit. PCI with stenting, no benefit. And there are five exceptions. The first one is the ACE of pilot study. This was a study of halter guided versus symptom guided uh, anti anginal therapy. And in this pilot study, there was a benefit for surgery, but it was just a pilot, pilot study. No benefit for PTCA as it was then, but for surgery. The SWISSI 2 trial was a positive trial, but these were patients who were asymptomatic post-myocardial infarction with a positive stress test. So this is not really the same as chronic stable angina. The TIME trial was a trial of high-risk older patients who basically had failed medical therapy and then an interesting trial, they were re-randomized uh, to medical therapy versus revascularization. So that I'm not sure that we'd better do that trial today, but that trial was positive, but only for a period of two to three years and then the benefit of surgery fell away. Barry 2 d a trial of diabetics showed there, there's a subset in the Barry 2 d trial that I'll come back to. It showed a benefit for surgery, not PCI, and the FAME-2 trial, where the major benefit was on urgent revascularization. But once one got out to five years, uh, there was a benefit in terms of late myocardial infarction as well. I was on the DSMB of that trial. There was some criticism that we stopped it relatively early. Uh, we can talk about that in the discussion period. I, 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 um, I, I think it was appropriate to stop the trial and then subsequently, we did see a benefit in late MI. No more meta-analyses. We've had enough. If you torture the data sufficiently, sooner or later, it will confess. It seems that every single time that there is another trial that is done, there's another meta-analysis uh, that comes up the next day or the next week. We've got four meta-analyses of PCI, none of them, none PCI in stable chronic coronary disease, PCI versus medical therapy, none of them have shown a benefit in terms of death and MI, except, um, except for the exception I showed you with FAME. So if you look at the guideline recommendations, and I'm using the ESC recommendations because they're the most recent, this is 2019. What you really see is that for prognosis, everything is really driven by the coronary anatomy. And that's because these are these randomized trials, the randomization took place after angiography. So for prognosis, left main, proximal LAD, three vessel disease with LV dysfunction, single remaining patent coronary artery with stenosis greater than 50%. And we'll come back to this large area of ischemia detected by functional testing or abnormal invasive FFR. And I'll come back to that as we discuss the ischemia trial. For symptoms, very clear cut. I mean, if people don't respond, patients don't respond to medical therapy, that's a class one indication and uh, very appropriate. So these are the guidelines. The ACC AHA guidelines are not that different, but they're anatomically driven. Now, the most recent trials was Courage, Barry 2D and FAME 2. And to summarize, in angiographically selected patients with chronic stable angina and preserved LV function, there is no benefit from coronary revascularization upon death and MI. Two higher risk subsets, the exceptions are in, in the Barry 2D trial of diabetics, we defined a high risk subgroup based upon an angiographic score and the framing him, a framing him clinical score. In that group, there was a benefit for surgery, but not for PCI. And then I mentioned the FAME2 trial where people with an FFR of less than 0.8 were randomized. And uh, this trial was stopped prematurely 
uh, mainly because of a very high rate of early revascularization uh, and the scheme in the presence of ischemia. It was not powered to answer mortality. Uh, five years later, or the five year follow up, also showed a reduction in myocardial infarction. And this was accompanied by a meta analysis from Zimmerman et al. of FAME2 and two other trials that reinforced the benefit of. Uh, PCI in people with an FFR of less than 0.8. So the question that remains is how do you extrapolate to the population at large and what is the role of stress testing? What is the role of revascularization in patients with moderate to severe ischemia and mild to moderate angina? And that's really the only un other unanswered question because all of these are the trials were angiographically selected. And that brings us to the ischemia trial uh, run by Dr. Judy Hoffman. Now, one of the drivers for the ischemia trial is this study, which is a registry study from Cedar sinai by Rory Hakamovich and Dan Berman, 14,000 patients who had adenosine or exercise spec. Shown here is the log hazard ratio for mortality. And on this axis is the amount of myocardium are deemed to be ischemic. And what you can, sorry, what you can see is that once you get to around about 12, 13% of the left ventricle being ischemic, thereafter the hazard ratio for medical therapy increases and for uh, revascularization decreases. So the conclusion from this study, much quoted study in a very large study, was that there's a certain threshold of ischemia beyond which or above which a bypass surgery or PCI revascularization uh, will have a, um, a beneficial impact on longevity and survival. So that this really uh, in a way fueled um, the design of the ischemia trial. And subsequently in the last six months, there's been an almost very similar study using PET that shows almost the same thing. So you know the design of the ischemia trial. I won't spend any time on that. This is from Dr. Hoffman's presentation. The uh, primary endpoint was CV death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest. And um, uh, 5,000 patients, a very difficult trial to do. Uh, and uh, I think she deserves a great deal of credit for bringing this trial to fruition. Uh, these, in terms of the composite endpoint, what you see is early on a higher event rate in the invasive arm shown in red, and then the curves cross over, and later at uh, four to five years, there actually is a higher event rate in the conservative arm. But overall, this is a neutral trial. The, Hazard ratio is 0.93, key value 0.34. Now, these events here are di driven by myocardial infarction. In the invasive arm, it's periprocedural AMI, and in the uh, conservative arm, it's spontaneous myocardial infarction. And the question is really, one needs additional follow up, and hopefully, they will have the funding to uh, have the funding to. Um, uh, continue follow-up out to 10 years. So the other aspect of this trial that perhaps hasn't been emphasized enough is from John Spertus, who did this uh, quality of life study. He used the baseline Seattle angina questionnaire frequency, uh, daily angina, weekly angina, monthly angina, no angina. And this is the change in the score with revascularization. And what you see is if you have frequent angina, a score of 35, which is somewhere between daily and weekly, uh, you have a marked improvement in the score with, um, uh, with um, revascularization. On the other hand, if you only have angina on a monthly basis, uh, the improvement you get is much less. So the more symptomatic you are, the greater the benefit from revascularization and symptoms. And in fact, in a 
separate analysis if you look at the proportion of patients who are free of angina at three months. It again depends upon the frequency uh, before revascularization. And this carries on to month 12 and one month 36. So what are the implications of the ischemia trial? Exclusions, and I think these, this is critically important to understand. Recent acute coronary syndrome, EF less than 35, left main disease, 5% had left main disease, they were excluded. Severe symptoms on optimal medical therapy excluded. This is interesting and I'm not sure I quite understand this. In the um, design paper, they state that if in the physician's judgment, there was a high likelihood of unprotected left main disease, they were excluded. They weren't excluded, they, they were excluded right from the big beginning. They weren't, they didn't go through the screening process uh, with CT scans and so on. So who were these patients? We know that 26,000 patients were initially screened and uh, I, I think, <laughs> worry about this, uh, who, who are they? And what would make you think there's a high likelihood of unprotected left main disease? Well, if you put someone on a treadmill, they can only go two minutes, they drop their blood pressure, uh, the LV dilates, the symptom is not pain, but dyspnea. All of these are high risk features. And I suspect that many of those patients were excluded. It's not a criticism, it's really, I can understand why they're excluded, but we need to know more about those patients. I do not know whether they have that data, but I think it's being looked at. So who were included? Stable patients, the low mortality risk, angina class one to two, 92%, ejection fraction, 60%. And what are the outcomes to summarize? Favorable in both groups largely confirmatory of prior trials. Uh, these are relatively low risk patients. And we saw this also in America. There's a trend towards an increasing rate of spontaneous MI in the conservative group, as I showed you. Needs long-term follow-up. We, we really need that data. The spontaneous MIs may have a bigger effect on prognosis than periprocedural MI. There was an impressive improvement, I think, in quality of life in patients with significant symptoms to begin with. And in the editorial by Antman and Brownwald, uh, they stated, however, an invasive strategy is a reasonable approach at any time for symptom relief. And I agree with that. I think if you start off with a trial of optimal medical therapy, <laughs> it's not a life sentence. You can... Um, uh, you can change at any time and switch to revascularization. And then finally, uh, and this has just come out this week, I think, in the European Heart Journal, we stated this, I think there's going to be a likely decline in the future use of stress testing as opposed to CTA uh, with or without FFR. I mean, 14% of patients in this trial had a positive stress test had no obstruction and uh, left main disease was picked up on a CT scan in, in, in 5% um, and not on the stress test. So I do think, uh, again, if you look at the recent iteration of the ESC guidelines for chronic coronary syndromes, we've anticipated that. And you'll see that CTA, which is not a topic I'm gonna to talk on today, but it is way up that diagnostic ladder, uh, particularly for people with a low unlikelihood of obstructive disease. Uh, the, the other aspect of the ischemia trial, which is interesting, and I'd love to hear some, some of your views on this, uh, was presented, hasn't yet been published. If you look at the number of diseased vessels in the conservative arm and in the intervention arm, there's a clear relationship uh, between one, two, and three vessel disease. Well, there's nothing unusual about that. I think we, we knew that 30 years ago. But this surprises me. Look at the severity of ischemia. There's a trend downwards, actually. The more severe the degree of ischemia, uh, the, the greater, uh, the, 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 the less the event rate. And uh, I think this is, um, there's a fair amount of discussion about this. I know that um, uh, Greg Stone 
feels and appropriately that with four methods of me different methods of measuring ischemia, this may have brought heterogeneity and, and diluted the effect. The other though, possibility, I don't know if it can be proven, is that those people with severe ischemia who also had other high risk features on a stress test just went, uh, were excluded and revascularized. And, and that there's certain amount of bias in this because this is contrary to what we led to believe. I mean, the more ischemia you have, the greater the effect on uh, mortality, but that's um, on events. And that's not what we see here. We can discuss that later. And no differences between the invasive and conservative groups. Now, is this going to have an impact on the guidelines? I think it, it should. These are the ESC guidelines in people who are, uh, do not have angina, but documented ischemia. What did we state? If they had ischemia greater than 10% of the LV, consider revascularization on top of medical therapy. <clears throat> and I think that now needs to be revisited in the next uh, iteration of the guidelines. And that is, ischemia alone without other high-risk features. And I want to keep emphasizing that. Without other, other high-risk features on a stress test, ischemia alone maybe should not be a class one indication. we we'll have to see. So uh, to summarize, uh, what are the implications of the trial? In terms of angiography and revascularization, revascularization <clears throat> if you have severe symptoms, revascularized for quality of life. Severe ischemia on imaging plus other high risk stress test features, the indication is to improve survival. Nothing's changed. Severe ischemia on imaging alone, uh, this should be a question mark. I'm not sure that we, I think the ischemia trial would suggest that you will not improve survival uh, in those patients and I would start off with the trial of optimal medical therapy. That's a question mark. LV dysfunction, we've got ample evidence that this is a strong indication for revascularization, depending upon uh, viability and function and so on. But that hasn't changed. So if you see a patient has already undergone angiography, then I think we have to use prior anatomic-based guidelines, hemodynamic lesion assessment, if we are in the era of FFR and IFR. Well, it, you know, the ischemia trial still, and I'm pleased to say is going to have, should have a significant impact. This is a paper um, in JAMA about a month ago from the National um, Cardiac Data Registry Database uh, held by the ACC. About 300 odd thousand patients and what they did was they looked at the appropriate use criteria established three years before. Really appropriate, the definition of really appropriate was asymptomatic patients or non-anginal chest pain and patients without LV dysfunction. So if you look at the yellow, these are the current appropriate use criteria. About 50% appropriate, may be appropriate in about 40% and very few really appropriate, uh, two to 3%. If you then implement to them the ischemia results, namely uh, if a patient is asymptomatic or has non-anginal chest pain, no LV dysfunction, but you have a positive stress test showing ischemia, that now becomes really appropriate. And this is a, a substantial number of people. It's about 20% of the total uh, would be reclassified. And if they had a trial of optimal medical therapy before uh, going to revascularization or angiography, uh, this could have a significant impact on costs. And I think this is an important sequel of the ischemia trial. Now to move on to the methods of revascularization. 15 trials of bypass surgery versus balloon angioplasty are the only exception was the diabetic subgroup in Barry, no difference in death or MI. At least no difference in death or MI with the exception of the diabetic subgroup in Barry, where there was a huge difference in favor of bypass surgery over plain old balloon angioplasty. The bare metal stent versus PTCA, no difference. 
BMS versus DES, no difference. And then we have um, five trials of 3,253 patients in a Barry 2D, in the, uh, which was not a randomized trial of cabbage versus PCI. That was left to the discretion of the investigator. But if you look at the diabetics in that group, uh, there was, I mean, if you look at those who had bypass surgery in this trial of diabetics, there was a subset with a higher rate, uh, with a, a better survival with bypass surgery. And then there's the syntax trial showing benefits in three vessel disease and left main disease subsets that I'll come to. And then Dr. Fuster's trial, uh, the freedom trial, trial of diabetics with two and three vessel disease. But I put three vessel disease in parentheses because I think about 90 or 85% of the patients in that trial had three vessel disease. So large number of trials, no difference in death or MI, but some very notable and important exceptions that we'll get into. Now, if you look at randomized trials and registry studies of coronary revascularization, registry studies are of greater relevance to the practice at large, but they all confounded, all. And there's tremendous selection bias. Randomized trials, and this is from a, paper I wrote with Thor Sunt, who's um, at um, Mass General now, but when he was at Mayo. And we, we talked about randomized trials of revascularization and discussed the phenomenon of entry bias. Now remember to get into these trials, you had to have an angiogram and then you had to have equipoise. You had to look at that angiogram and say, I don't know whether PCI or bypass surgery would be better. If you did have a feeling about one or the other, probably unethical to randomize. So entry trial, uh, randomized trials are very exclusionary because the inclusion criteria mandate clinical equipoise and eligibility for both forms of therapy. I can't tell you how often I've heard, well, the COURAGE trial only enrolled 12% of patients screened. Well, that's by design, really because you know, they relatively low risk patients that you uh, clearly have clinical equipoise. The other problem with these trials, they're difficult to do. They take five, six, seven years. And by the time you finish the trial, there's a new antithrombotic or a new stent. And then you get criticized because it's obsolescent. And uh, this, we discussed this in an editorial with my friend and colleague, Bob Fry. Uh, and this was an editorial dealing with the New York State Registry. He said, well, you know, things may not be quite what they seem. Now, a great example of that is drug-eluting stents story. We knew years ago that drug-eluting stents markedly reduced the rates of restenosis. No effect on mortality, but restenosis. And then Roxana and Greg will remember this, the firestorm at the ESC. Up comes a presentation from the Swedish National Registry that says people with drug eluding stents had an increase in death and MI. Overnight, I think the, the proportion of patients receiving drug eluding stents in the States dropped by, I think about 25%. I may be wrong, but it was a substantial drop. Well, let's go back. In 2006, who are the people that got drug eluding stents? They were the sick of people. Diffuse disease, diabetes, small vessel, complex lesions. Then in 2008, 2009, another paper from the same Swedish registry in the same journal, namely the New England Journal of Medicine comes out and lo and behold, drug eluding stents reduce death in MI. But by then, when drug eluding stents were so widely used, who were the people that got bare metal stents? Well, they, they uh, were sicker patients. They couldn't afford clopidogrel. They were non-compliant. They had comorbidities at risk of bleeding, non-cardiac surgery, high bleeding risk. So they're a different, completely different population. The fact is, drug eluding stents probably have very little, at least at that time, effect on death and MI. They reduce rates of restenosis dramatically. Maybe the third generation drug-leading stents may 
have an impact. There's some data from Europe on, on death and MI. But this whole controversy uh, was caused by the fact that this was a registry with confounders. And as much as you try and adjust for these statistically, you cannot eliminate them. And uh, one thing I've tried to do, and I don't even think Dr. Fust has been able to do this, and that is publish two papers in the New England Journal three years apart, and the, first, the second one contradicts the first one. Uh, that's never, I've never been that fortunate. So when you look at data from registries and trials, they, they can be complementary, but there are potential pitfalls. All registries are confounded to some extent. And when we do multivariate analyses, we adjust for known differences in baseline variables. But we, ca we cannot eliminate them. We can't adjust statistically for what we've never measured in the first place. So it comes down to the fact that as you look at the data from registries and trials, uh, you have to become a doctor. And then you've got to take a number of other factors into account, not just the p-value, age, comorbidities, frailty, the coronary anatomy, patient preferences, shared decision-making, uh, other characteristics, psychological and social. And then one of the other factors that we really don't take into account in these trials is operator proficiency. You know in your institution who is good at what. But in general, in these trials, we assume that everybody is competent, but uh, uh, one of the trials of um, uh, multiple arterial grafting, uh, surgical trials, really probably was seriously flawed because there were varying degrees of surgical experience with uh, bilateral mammary grafting. Composite endpoints. Well, uh, uh, they do increase statistical power. They increase the frequency of events. Uh, they're very convenient because if you have a composite endpoint, you can have a major impact on sample size and cost. You can really reduce the sample size and increase uh, and reduce the cost. But there is a caveat, and uh, Stuart Pocock, who many of you know and works um, uh, with uh, Mount Sinai and particularly uh, Greg and Roxana, in this um, review in Jack, we said, but there's a danger that you can oversimplify the evidence by putting too much emphasis on the composite. And let me go through the syntax trial and illustrate that. So the syntax trial of bypass surgery with tax versus taxes sets sense. If you look at the major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events, highly, highly significant difference in favor of uh, cabbage, P.002. What about the individual components? Death, no difference. MI, no difference. Stroke, actually higher in the surgical arm. Now, remember the trial was not powered for these individual endpoints, but you still have to look at them as you try and understand the impact on the composite endpoint. So what was the difference? The difference was really repeat revascularization. And uh, repeat revascularization is, is not the same as uh, death or a myocardial infarction. This is taken from very close to where I live. Uh, going beyond this point may result in death and or loss of skiing privileges. Well, at $185 a day, losing your skiing privileges is quite a serious event, but it's not the same as death. Uh, and um, I think this illustrates composite endpoints quite well. So to move on, diabetics. This is a very good meta-analysis from Stuart Head, recently published. Uh, 11 trials, drug-eluting stents in 73%, and bypass in yellow, PCI in orange. Clearly in diabetics, there is a favor, there, there is uh, the um, benefits of bypass surgery over PCI are well-documented. And these are the results in patients without diabetes. And I think it's, it's, it's um, it is explicable. If you look at diabetics, they have diffuse disease, aggressive disease, chronic total occlusions, and increased plaque vulnerability. Uh, these are patients that 
should be completely revascularized if possible, and particularly if they're young. And PCI is lesion directed. So what PCI uh, attacks the culprit, but it doesn't address the future culprits that all down the length of the artery, the uh, non-obstructive vulnerable plaques, an area that Greg Stone is really interested in. It doesn't address that. Bypass and secondary prevention address the culprit lesions and the future culprits, at least in the epicardial vessel. And I can see why biologically this would uh, bypass would be superior to um, PCI in many diabetic patients. The other issue, which is really going to be um, incredibly interesting over the next five years or so, is as we explore the role of microvascular dysfunction, not just in people with non-obstructive coronary arteries, but I think there's very good evidence that microvascular dysfunction plays a role after revascularization in, the, in recurrent symptoms. Now, uh, very interesting data here now from the syntax when we get into left main wounds. So in, for all patients in syntax, these were multivessel disease patients. Um, they were stratified here by the syntax score. And you see that there's a benefit for surgery in those with intermediate and high syntax scores. But in the left main group, uh, low and intermediate, no benefit for surgery over PCI. It was confined to the high risk score, higher scores. So with three vessel disease, both uh, intermediate and higher benefited from surgery. And with left main, it's just those with a high syntax score. And uh, I see that Greg is in the audience and this led to the Excel trial. Uh, and I thank him for including me as an investigator in that trial, uh, 1900 patients, syntax score less than 32, although a third of them in the 25% uh, on core lab readings actually had a higher syntax score. Everolimus eluting stents, death stroke or MI, hazard ratio one. Early event rate with surgery, curves at three years were crossing over. And uh, we noted that. Death from any cause, uh, again, not significant, but uh, just as you start to get out to three years, the curves are crossing over. And the prediction at that time was that we would probably see uh, um, over time a statistically significant difference in favor of surgery. The Noble trial from the Nordic countries, uh, this was their primary endpoint, uh, mainly driven by revascularization, as I'll show you. They did show a trend again, higher mortality with PCI, but not statistically significant at all a trend. And then if you look at stroke, it didn't make any sense at all. After somewhere after a year, the stroke rates went up in the PCI arm, which is you know, sometimes Murphy's law. Sometimes things don't work out. There's no way I can explain that. So the major driver of events in this trial uh, was um, repeat revascularization. So this led uh, to the uh, European Heart Journal guidelines, uh, Stefan Windecker, left main disease with a syntax score of less than 22, class one for cabbage, class one for PCI, uh, with an intermediate score, 2A for PCI, and with a high syntax score, everybody agreed it was a class three indication and a class one for bypass surgery. I think these guidelines um, were very appropriate. I'm not showing the ACC AHA guidelines because they really are much older and need to be, uh, need to be um, a, a new iteration needs to come out. Uh, the ACC AHA guidelines made, a, made a much more of a point about whether they were good or bad surgical candidates due to comorbidities, but these are anatomically based and I think appropriate. So the clinical implications after the XL three-year data, um, a commentary uh, including Greg, Deepak, Bat, and myself. We said uh, the Excel three-year data should impact current ACC AHA guidelines 
by broadening the patient pool that might undergo PCR. So we really felt that these guidelines should be redone and they, they would look much closer to the European guidelines, a class one recommendation, or at least a 2A. And then we emphasized the heart team decision. I mean, what do you do at 90 versus 60? Uh, comorbidities and frailty, the extent of disease and, and what are the distal targets like and is, uh, is the um, LAD amenable to PCI and so on. And then the perceived need for and technical likelihood of complete revascularization. And then came the five-year data published last year, death, stroke or MI, not significantly different but the trend that we saw at three years now is very much evident at five years. And if you go on to a couple more years, you may get a p-value of less than 0.05. Death stroke MI or ischemia driven reva revascularization significantly are different as in every other trial, uh, there's always more revascularization after PCI than after cabbage. And that was significant, but death from any cause uh, does achieve significance. 9.9% with cabbage, 13.0 with PCI. Uh, it is interesting that rates of adjudicated definite cardiovascular deaths were similar. The difference in all cause mortality between the groups was driven by non-cardiovascular deaths, especially from cancer and infections. Uh, there are people who say that in the PCI on uh, one of the reasons you will have excess deaths is because they're on dual antiplatelet therapy and a higher risk of bleeding. But uh, Greg can correct me. I don't think that was the case here. And stroke, not significant, but lower in the PCI. And so this then led to a meta-analysis of five trials, uh, risk of death at last follow-up. Uh, this is by Ahmed uh, working with um, Greg Stone. Uh, overall, if you take the five trials, absolutely no difference whatsoever. 1.03 um, uh, relative risk, 0.82 uh, and 1.30 crossing the line of identity. If you look at the XL trial, uh, it is an outlier. There's the all-cause mortality, or none of the other trials show this at all. And if you look at cardiovascular death or cardiac death, uh, the relative risk was exactly the same, 1.03. So I think uh, the data speak for itself. Well, then came the controversy. This is the latest iteration on October the 30th. Is the tide turning on the grubby affair of Excel and the European guidelines? Now, I was, am part of the Excel study, so I have a bias. Uh, and it's the opposite of what this um, article in, in heart.org suggests. I think it is, has been a grubby affair. And I think it's been a grubby affair because of a number of surgeons who decided to um, take the name off the paper and attack this trial. Now, uh, what I don't like about that is the attacks took place in the media, not medically. BB, British Broadcasting Corporation and numerous other non-medical newspapers. And um, we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but I think it has been a grubby affair and I blame the people that started it, but I have to admit uh, I have a bias. What are we really arguing about? Is it a genuine controversy or is this all just a distraction? Well, there's an argument, part of the, some of the uh, accusations uh, relate to CV or total mortality. A death is a death is a death, and that's all you that that's the end point. Well, we've been doing this for arguing about this for 25 years. Forever. It's open to interpretation, but it's a valid question to ask. And in the trial, um, there are data there for both total mortality and CV mortality. And you can make up your own mind. And then uh, much of it relies on the definitions of MI. The, the protocol determined definition was a CPK of greater than 10, the upper reference limit for both procedures. Then the other point is, do you count 
periprocedural MI is the same as spontaneous. Personally, I do not. I think that spontaneous MI is much more important. And then the other definition was the third universal definition based upon troponins and clinical evidence of ischemia. Well, I think troponins were only available in 50% of patients. The others had CPK. But this was the protocol determined definition of myocardial infarction prior to starting the trial. What is clinically important? What is clinically important? And it, it, the, it you know, the, the whole issue of periprocedural MI, uh, the first paper uh, uh, that I was involved in uh, on periprocedural MI was from the CAS study. And that, that was 1982. And we were arguing about how do you diagnose it and what does it mean? So it's difficult to, um, this shouldn't even just be procedural MI, but very procedural and spontaneous. What are the challenges? First of all, what biomarker do you use? What is the optimal biomarker? What is the peak threshold? How do you determine it? It's very arbitrary. You've got to decide whether you need supporting clinical ECG angiographic or imaging evidence it, uh, as well if ischemia need be present. And the extent to which criteria should vary between bypass surgery and PCI. And I was involved in a study with a randomized trial from Brazil called the MASS trial. And one of our uh, papers was we looked at our clinical diagnosis of procedural MI, but they all then had MRIs. And believe me, very few of them relatively had evidence of necrosis on an MRI. So it's a complex field and um, a number of issues uh, need to be taken into account. So John Gregson, who works with Stuart Pocock and Greg Stone, just published this paper in Jack, which I think is a really important paper. The incidence of different definitions of PMI and their effect on mortality, PMI being procedural um, MI. So if you look at the protocol definition, which was the one in the five-year paper, you see that there are fewer infants with PCI and more with bypass surgery. If you use the third universal definition of MI, mixed, that means patients who uh, the diagnosis was based either on troponins or CPKMB, and in fact, it differed according to whether or not you had uh, surgery or PCI. If you use this definition, you now have more infarcts in the PCI arm and less in the surgical arm. But what, is, what effect does it have on mortality? And here's the adjusted five-year cardiovascular death rate. These, uh, whether it, it was with PCI or bypass surgery in the protocol definition, which was the same for both procedures, uh, the effect on five-year cardiovascular death of a procedural MI is really very small. PCI crosses the line of identity, bypass surgery, uh, I think, I don't know whether that was borderline significant or not. But if you now take the new definition, which is what people argued about, well, you have fewer infants because it's you, you've raised the bar for a perioperative uh, post-bypass um, uh, procedural MI. You have fewer infarcts, but look at their effect on mortality. So it's very simple. Uh, you raise the bar, um, you'll get less infarcts, but they're bigger infarcts and they have a much bigger impact on mortality. So let's just use some common sense. As Voltaire said, Common sense is not so common. And let's get beyond the rhetoric. The bottom line is this, the absolute magnitude of the differences in hard endpoints is small, but it favors cabbage. And I think if you go on and follow up another five years, we will have a p-value that is statistically significantly different. But clearly there's a role for PCI in selected patients with unprotected left main disease. Clearly there's a role. The difference, the magnitude of the differences is very small. And it comes back to the clinical assessment. 
and particularly the patient-related aspects, age, comorbidities, frailty, patient preference, and operator proficiency, as I said earlier. So I think we've got data from these trials to show that uh, PCI may not be quite as good as bypass surgery in terms of uh, some of the, the mortality endpoints over time. But really, uh, are you going to take that into account when you use a 90-year-old, 90, or are you going to look at the patient in its entirety? So this is, uh, reminds me of Shakespeare's play, Much Ado About Nothing. Well, I don't think it's about nothing. It's not. I think these are valid issues which have been raised, which warrant discussion and have been addressed, but the controversy is overblown. And I think uh, seriously overblown. And um, uh, I refer you to the rebuttal letter written by Greg Stone. And uh, I believe now that there is a patient level meta-analysis uh, that the European Society of Cardiology is doing. Um, I, I think it will show what the previous meta-analysis has shown. Is I don't see that the results will be any different, but hopefully this will put it to rest. So to conclude, what have we learned after three decades, decades of randomized trials of revascularization on prognosis? The early trials 30 years ago taught us that uh, revascularization improves prognosis with LV dysfunction, severe angina and multivessel disease, left main disease, the VA trial, and diabetics who are a high risk clinical uh, diabetics. And um, this was the Barry 2D trial uh, where we defined a high risk angiographic and clinical subgroup. PCI versus medical therapy, FAME 2, major benefit on urgent revascularization, but a late benefit on myocardial infarction. And then what about the trials of bypass surgery versus P, uh, PCI? Well, um, in the PERI trial of PTCA, there was a benefit for surgery. Bare metal stents, uh, Barry 2D, a benefit for surgery. And then in the drug eluding stent era, we've got the data from the syntax uh, on three vessel disease and left main disease and the freedom trial uh, in diabetics, which is predominantly three vessel disease and clearly showed a, a benefit for surgery. And to summarize, the sicker the patient, the greater the benefit of revascularization over medical therapy and the greater the benefit of bypass versus PCI. And you can take all this data, much of it is obsolete, but it's enough to then look at a patient across the table and make a reasonable, coherent clinical decision. Now, th this is something that we have to live with. I mean, all of these trials have their limitations and a degree of obsolescence. We have better stents, better pharmacotherapy. Uh, these trials antedated the use of FFR, IFR, coronary flow reserve, and uh, Greg's trial of published uh, in Jack a month ago. Uh, really, I, I, I think you would agree, Greg, I'm calling this clock characterization. We're trying to characterize the vulnerable clock and uh, it's hypothesis generating, but should lead to another larger trial. The residual syntax score is a very useful tool of assessing how completely you will revascularize a patient. Um, the trials antedated the use of intravascular ultrasound in OCT. The radial artery approach to PCI was before these, uh, uh, post-dated, uh, the, came after these trials. And by and large, multiple arterial bypass grafts were a minority in any of these trials. Uh, the whole process of shared decision-making uh, is now really uh, part of clinical care. And then newer medical therapies. I mean, this is just in the last year. PSK9 inhibitors, icosa pent ethyl, SGL2 inhibitors, uh, GLP1 agonists, low dose rivaroxaban. Uh, can, can it, I can't remember the, how to pronounce it, but the Cantos trial of Canu uh, I don't know, whatever was in the end, uh, the, the trial, but it, it anti inflammatory. So, you know, this is 
this is a fact. And when you set in guidelines, you have to take all of this into account and integrate it. Uh, but you have to be aware of it. This is, I, I don't want to tout one of my own papers, but this, uh, really the driver of this was uh, Juan Carlos Caskey, Felipe Crayon, Paolo Camichi. But it was very, it was a lot of fun to work with them on this because I didn't know much about microvascular dysfunction. I wasn't even really that interested in it, which is why I was uh, incorporated um, into writing this paper. And um, I, I, I learned so much. And I, there is absolutely no doubt, I think, that when you look at people with angina and PCI and cabbage who come back with recurrent symptoms, it's the microvascular tear. And this is an area of future investigation. So to conclude with three points to be made. This is in the syntax trial, and this is what they defined optimum, optimal medical therapy. Uh, first of all, if you look at PCI and cabbage, look at the use, not even 50%. And by five years, only about 30% uh, are um, receiving optimal medical therapy. But look at the hazard ratio for heart events in those who were treated optimally with this combination. If they at one year were on optimal medical therapy versus those who were not, the hazard ratio is about 0.55. That's a 45% reduction in events. That's much greater than any difference between PCI and cabbage. And what we really have to understand is that secondary prevention is part and parcel of revascularization, period. This is from my colleague, Rajiv Galati, that we published in circulation a few years back. If you look at uh, mortality after PCI at the Mayo Clinic at five years, 1991 and 1996, the major cause of mortality is cardiac. In the next decade or five years, uh, now cardiac and non-cardiac are equal. And in the most recent 2003 to 2008, the major cause of five-year mortality is non-cardiac, not cardiac. I think we're doing a great job with treating the cardiovascular system, but these are older patients with comorbidities and we have to pay attention to uh, other aspects of the patients. It is really interesting to see though, that the cardiac mortality uh, has actually gone down, but non-cardiac has gone up. And this is going to be an increasing trend as the population ages. So my uh, last slide is, uh, relates to the ICD definitions of death. So uh, this is in the New Yorker, death by flaming water, ski, and other misfortunes. Now, I, I had um, the misfortune of serving as chair of the cardiovascular committee for the recoding the ICD. And I tell you, this was not easy to work with the World Health Organization. But what we did come up with, or they came up with, was in 2015, there are 18,000 new ways to die. Uh, and this is, remember, this is in total, not just the cardiovascular system. So you wonder what, what is going on with this cartoon. Well, this is one way you can die. Bitten by an orca, stabbed while crocheting. I put a question mark there, is that murder or accidental? Insect bite non-venomous of the anus. So if it's non-venomous, and you get bitten in the butt, why, why do you die? What do you die of? Exposure to ignition of plastic jewelry. And finally, problems in relationship with in-laws. So thank <laughs> you. Thank you for inviting me. And wow. uh, close it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bernie. What a wonderful, wonderful comprehensive talk. We've kept the audience here um, at times. It was close to 100 people here in the room. Uh, but before we lose them, let me open this up to Dr. Fuster. We have Dr. Fuster. We have Dr. Stone and multitudes of people here uh, for a wonderful, lively discussion for the next 10 minutes. Dr. Fuster. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bernie, for this uh, excellent review. Uh, just to relate to you two papers published this week and last week, uh, this week, we published a paper in Jack, which is exactly what you presented. Basically the importance 
of stable and the approach to stable coronary artery disease about medical therapy versus intervention with the exceptions that you said. And in the Lancet, we have a very important issue. The trials in a long-term follow-up is different than what we have in the first two, three, four years. And this is in the Lancet also this week with, uh, with uh, Sir Royce and others. So I think uh, I agree with everything you said. I would only add that the long-term follow-up may be changing things uh, in a way, and even including the ischemia trial. Uh, I think you make a really good point. Do you want to comment on that, Dr. Gersh, that the longer term follow-up, you begin to un unravel many things that may or may not be related and uh, although extremely important. So maybe you want to comment on that and then we'll go to Greg and, uh, and see what his uh, comments are here. These are a lot of the trials that you've been involved in, and it's just so nice to have someone outside of the institution really dissect this for us, Greg. So thanks oh, for being I, here. I've really got nothing to add. I mean, I, I think the main limitation on long-term follow-up has been expensive, difficulty in, 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 in getting patients to stay with the trial for a long period of time. But, you know, the ischemia trial, clearly we need longer follow-up. Um, Excel. And uh, hopefully the funding is there for it. I mean, ultimately, every survival curve does come down to zero. I mean, <laughs> and, and I would expect that um, you know, what we will see with these analyses of long-term follow-up will be years of life gained. I mean, no one's immortal. But it, we will probably see differences start to narrow. But at least in Excel and in ischemia, we may see those differences widen. And I hope we get the long-term follow-up. So that was a fantastic talk as always. Always insightful. I always learn something. Um, I, I would make a few points that I think people overlook. You know, um, first, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that PCI and cabbage have different mortalities, different myocardial infarction rates, and different stroke rates. If you were to enroll a uh, hundred thousand patients or a million patients into randomized trials, you're going to get significant p-values. There, there's a difference between these two procedures. But what people are not focusing on is the absolute difference, and that's what really matters to patients. So, for example, um, you show a meta-analysis of left main PCI versus DS. The uh, ultimate uh, hazard ratio is 1.03 for all cause mortality. Again, with a million patients, that would be a significant difference, right? But look at even an Excel, which is the outlier that has the biggest difference in mortality, which was 3% at five years. If you talk to most patients and you tell them there's a difference in 3% uh, at five years, a 0.6% difference per year. And to achieve that, you have to undergo the upfront risks of surgery bleeding, transfusions, AFib, orlanic coagulation, stroke, um, re low, longer return to work, more pain, et cetera. Come on, let's be honest. Most patients are going to say that's not a good trade-off. And we have to get to the point where we're starting to take patient-reported outcomes and preferences into account, and we have to look at absolute differences. Similarly, if you look at the ischemia trial, there, and I was the head of the revascularization committee on the ischemia trial, there were not big differences. Some people have argued the curves do cross and actually the confidence interval uh, is right at 0% for the invasive group. But, there's, but they're non-proportional hazards and they're very similar outcomes. So we have to start using some common sense uh, when we recommend to patients. We're not trying to tell them your p-value is 0.0006 of lower mortality. We've got to explain to them, this is a small difference in stroke. This is a small difference in survival. But these are, this is what you'll go through with each procedure. Why don't I stop there and get your uh, well, I, absolute I, risks? Versus you are absolutely you, you preaching to the converted. I couldn't agree more. I don't know if you can still see my slides. Can you? We do. Okay. So there's just the two slides that I think are really important. Common sense is not so common. And that's what we need. I think it was Rob Califf who said, for a difference to be a difference has got to make a difference. And then I think you and Stuart Pocock 
I quote you all the time, a p-value is no substitute for a brain. And then I think this is basically my most important slide. The absolute magnitude of the differences in hard endpoints is small, but favor cabbage. And of course, there's a role for PCI in selected patients with unprotected left main disease. All of these factors are important and patient preference. And I think what we do have is, I, I think we really do have uh, a, a large body of evidence which we can use to give a patient an intelligent, informed opinion. That's it. We're never going to have that trial of 100,000 patients. But well, I, I, think, I, I think you guys are making really, really a, a great point, and I think this was wonderful. And, and Greg, you're completely correct about that. But I want to just say that anytime you present a patient a lesser invasive strategy, for them to to be um, to be treated by, they're going to choose that. But I also think it's up to us as clinicians to make sure that we're presenting uh, the uh, the scenarios to that patient with some level of authority and some level of knowledge of what is out there. Uh, and I think our uh, opinion on how we should be choosing which revascularization strategy or even a revascularization in terms of like a stable ischemic heart disease is gonna be really, really important uh, uh, to, to evaluate. So what's your view on that? Uh, you know, of course, yeah. you know, patients will always choose. If you say, I'm gonna crack your chest open versus, oh, you'll be home tomorrow and back to work on yeah. Monday, they're gonna choose that lesser uh, invasive path. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, I think, I think the, the emphasis is on an educated, informed opinion. And this really came up in the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines uh, in terms of alcohol septal ablation versus surgical myectomy. And we put in there, if after a balanced and informed discussion, the patient absolutely does not want to undergo surgery, then uh, uh, alcohol septal ablation, I think was a 2A indicator. But we, and, and then in the text we said, a balanced and informed discussion. And it's not, and that is not, listen, I'm going to put this little thing in your groin and you'll go home today. Uh, it's got to be a balanced, informed, educated opinion. Now, interestingly enough, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, most of our patients have already read the literature and the patient-based literature. We do about 280 myectomies a year and about 40 alcohol septal ablations. And there it is really interesting to see the patient saying, okay, I've look, looked at this, I've read this. Now I just want to get this done. And uh, I want the, the, their preference is surgery. But this is a much younger and a very different group of patients. And I think um, my approach to a diabetic uh, who's 55 years old with a three vessel coronary disease is going to be very, very different. Uh, from uh, how I'd approach someone with a lot of comorbidities at the age of 90 or yeah. whatever. But, but so I think we're going to take, take one can... last question from anybody else, and then we have to close at the top of the hour. Sorry, Greg, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, just a quick comment on that. I think that the 55-year-old the diabetic with severe diffuse triple vessel disease and the 90-year-old are clearly at the extremes of the spectrum. Right. And when you're at the extremes, it's easy to be prescriptive as a yeah. physician and to say, you would be crazy if you don't do this or that. And I would, you know, strongly for my family member or for me, want this or that. But most of the patients fall in the middle. So, you know, I, I'm 63. And if I had um, with left main disease, and if I had an intermediate syntax score, and then I've got to consider the chance of a 90% chance of being alive at five years versus an 87% chance of being alive at five years, and a 1% difference in stroke, and then to give up two months of my life um, to recover from surgery, yeah. that's got to be my decision. And I've really got to be informed, and I've got to weigh what my value says is important to me. And so I think we have to start moving as physicians to be able to effectively communicate these options to patients 
pros and cons. And that's difficult to do. And it's more time consuming than say, you need to undergo surgery. No, you're 100% correct. Any last, one last question? We have time for one question. We will close at the top of the hour. Thank you. One last uh, question. Uh, Pedro, Pedro Moreno, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Bernie. Fantastic talk. Quick. Uh, Hello, I think Pedro. The How are you, man? I think the controversy between DS and cabbage in the refractory angina patient uh, is, is very nicely discussed. Uh, but my, my main trouble right now with the patient in, when I am analyzing a, a classic ischemia patient, classic ischemia trial patient, mother or severe ischemia on the stress test and mild symptoms that are being treated with medical therapy. Do you recommend to do a CT angio on these patients? I mean, my fear is to miss um, the main um, or to uh, just do something for normal coronary. Uh, what what I would do, and I, I, I just kind of try and make this brief because I know the, the time constraints. Um, if I think that the patient really has obstructive coronary disease, and if they have severe ischemia on a stress test with other findings that support that, a drop in blood pressure, short, poor effort tolerance and so on, dyspnea, LV dilatation on a spec, if they have that, I'm going straight to an angiogram. If on the other hand, their symptoms are mild, they have severe ischemia, quote, uh, on a stress test, but their effort tolerance is good. They go eight, 10 minutes, um, whatever. And they have no other high risk features. I would think about a CT to exclude non-obstructive disease. Uh, uh, and uh, I would then probably give them a trial of medical therapy. But if you look at those ESC guidelines, CT angiography has gone way up on the diagnostic um, lab, ladder of diagnostic approaches. And um, I did think just the one other point, I agree 100% with what Greg says, that question of operator proficiency comes into. So if I have a younger patient who's a diabetic, uh, I really want to be sure that the surgeon is going to do multiple arterial graphs. And I think uh, that's important. You, you know your own surgeons and your own institution. But as always, thank you for the questions and it's a great pleasure to be I mean, I wish I was there in person, but. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you, Bernie Gersh, for coming and, and, and giving us this fantastic talk. Thank you, Dr. Fuster, for presiding. And thank you all for being here. We look forward to having you in person with us right at Mount Sinai in the heart of New York City. Stay mm -hmm. safe, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Roxana, just to... This time, um, last, yesterday, I was uh, giving a webinar in India and looking out of my study window on the left, uh, a great big bull moose came and pruned uh, the tree outside, outside our house. So uh, it's a little different from being in the center of New York. Yes, thank you, Bernie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.